Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Oh, and we are back in my bed apartment. Mm-mm. Um, yeah, we had, we had our last podcast at Purdue. Live. live at Purdue. You can pick up the vinyl record <laughs> now in all uh, <laughs> FYE stores. What if we released our podcasts on vinyl? That would be next level. And each podcast takes like what? How long does it, vinyl take to make? You probably it probably takes like a couple of weeks to get you, a vinyl done. Well, you know that um, Jack White has Third Man Records. That's his record label, and you can go to Third Man Records, and they have this stage where you can record directly to a record, like they instantly. Yeah, they you can go in there. And record into these microphones, and it'll create a record oh, on so the spot. I, for whatever reason, I thought that records were like in, re, they were re, engraved on a steel plate, and then the steel plate was used to manufacture that's, the record. That's only yeah, that's only in the process of creating duplicates. Oh, but you know when when records first started out, and and it was just like essentially a reverse gramophone. It was yeah. you were recording into it. And it had a little etcher thing. Yeah, they would actually place the band. You say they were recording a big band. They would place the instruments based on how loud they were in order to balance the sound. <laughs> that sounds like how I place you in my room. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, I'm currently sitting in uh, Nick's bathroom. Yeah, most people don't know that. Yeah. We actually have two live streams going on just so that we can see each other at the same time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, history aside, Purdue was great. It was a great time. A lot of fun. Cool little town. Yeah. Nice and quaint. We met a lot of cool people, reconnected with some cool people. Yeah. Shout uh, out to Rotimi. Rotimi. For, very cool guy. For shuttling us around. Yeah, he was our chauffeur. <laughs> Um, I also want to shout out, I met a patron. You remember when oh. I had Patreon like last year? Yeah. And it was like a good thing. It was a good thing that I had going. Is this kid still paying you? No, 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 no. I stopped the payments. <laughs> um, this, I uh, just met, shout out to Justin. Um, it was great meeting you. And, uh, I don't know. It was my first patron that I've ever met. And it just felt like really awesome. So yeah. Just meet someone that has really supported me and, he was like, "Yeah, I love the podcast. I yeah. really think you guys are doing some great stuff." So yeah, we had we had some guys come up to us. And, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, right after the podcast, and um, I, I'll I'll look them up real quick so we can give them a proper shout out. But they they came up to me and they said, "Now, James." In episode three of the podcast, and I was like, "Oh my god, we're Star Trek." <laughs> Uh, in episode three of the podcast, you told, you said that if anybody came up to you and asked you, you would give them your SoundCloud. And so the SoundCloud of original music that I made, I think, gosh, is it like 10 years ago now? Like nine or 10 years ago, I made this music. Was this, and this is just the garage band. Yes. This is, these yeah. are the garage band days. When you first got that MacBook, you open uh, up garage band, you're like, Ooh, oh, yeah. look what I can do. Oh yeah. Yeah. Dude, I, I loved making some laptop music. I will say, I believe the the students that you gave your SoundCloud to are the only students that have both yours and my SoundCloud. Yeah, you gave it you gave them yours as well. Because I don't even think I've heard your SoundCloud, to be honest, James. I don't even think you showed me your SoundCloud. No. And I don't even know if I've showed you my SoundCloud. I I don't I don't know. This sounds this sounds risque. <laughs> Showing each other each other's sound clouds. Um, but yeah, it was awesome meeting everyone. And uh, um, yeah, I guess our sound clouds are out there now. Our young, you know, garage band days. Yes. Um, I'm trying I'm trying to find the names, the names of the of the characters that came up to us, but I can't seem to. Is it this one? No, Rotimi didn't. Did he tag them? Oh, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, that's this James, is James is this uh, is what they look like, people. Okay, if you're, um, yes, you're on, so <laughs> if you're on the YouTube, you can see that they look. Yeah, like can I a wait? Bunch of students. Wait, enhance, enhance. Right, I'm trying that's to look right. at the name tag. Um, but anyway, uh, let us know who you are, and we'll shout you out in the next episode. But um, we really appreciate the fans coming out, and hopefully, we got some new fans because there were definitely people in the audience who had never heard the podcast before. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I also, we have missed this, but three, four weeks ago, maybe 
was our minor details one year birthday. Oh, happy man. birthday. Happy, <laughs> I, I was like, a, was happy like a, birthday. Wait, are you about to give me a piece of paper? Because it no, is it's, it's my chapstick. Oh, no, I don't want your chapstick. Because uh, the first year anniversary, well, traditionally, it's the paper anniversary. And uh, then more recently, it's the clock anniversary. What? I know this because I'm married. What is it? You give a, someone a clock? Yeah. That's like, kind of cool. But in the old days, it was paper. They were they were much more frugal back then. Here's what? a piece of paper. Thanks a lot. Um, but yeah, just thought I'd shout that out. I thought that was a fun little anecdote. Yes. Um, Thank you to everybody who's been here in the last year, been supporting us. Yeah. I want to kind of, I'm kind of curious, like, who's OG? Oh, man. Who is, who is a episode one person? Well, those kids that reference episode three sounded pretty OG to me. They sound pretty OG for yeah. sure. Um. Yeah, any any weekly updates? I know we've spent the past like six days straight together, James. But uh... yeah, well, I mean, it, it was kind of a result of the conference, but I really can't blame the conference. I just had to get back on Instagram. Wait, you're back? I'm back, baby. You're back. I'm He's back, back, baby. He's back. I'm back, baby. I don't. I don't know how much I'm gonna post. I, I don't know. You know, I posted today about the Purdue thing. Yeah. Um. But, uh, you know, I, I, I had a realization today, Nick, and I, I want to see what you think about this. You know, part of the thing about being gone from Instagram was there was this moment, there was this period of time where it took adjustment of in those moments of, of nothing going on, wanting to pull out the phone. And I was thinking about this as like, this is a, this is a product of you know, obviously like this slot machine app that makes you want to go back to check, yeah, that check dope, your likes and all these things. Hit, right. But the other thing is, is that we're, we're in modern times. We're in the midst of modernization. A lot of our daily tasks are much more, much more shortened by technology. And so we have these gaps, these periods where we we just have nothing to do. Interesting. And so interesting. What do you do with that time? Like I don't know. I you know, if I really wanted to get off Instagram completely, I would have to bring a yo-yo around with me everywhere <laughs> in order to occupy myself during downtime. I see. So and, it's like you're saying like now that we live in the 21st century, we can, you know, make breakfast or like even go get breakfast in five minutes and right. drink a coffee. Whereas if we lived in the 1800s, it would be like, yeah. all right, let's you'd go have to milk, get up, milk the cow, yeah. collect the eggs from the, <laughs> the uh, chicken coop. Yeah, you'd have to churn the butter. Right. It takes two hours to make the bread. Yeah, yeah. You would have to, you'd have to wake up three hours before you went to sleep <laughs> in order to do all of that. But uh, interesting. Yeah, it's an I, interesting theory. James. It's a it's a theory. It's probably not very valid. It's probably not a good one. But it's just it, kind of like a justification, I guess. Yeah. Right? But it is it is something where I just find myself in downtime, and I'm like, gosh, I there's this whole community out there that's still going on, and I want to be a part of that, and I want to see what's going on. Uh, so yeah, I'm back on Instagram. Welcome back. Thank Welcome you back. very much. I'm excited to see what you post, James. Now you got now you got the all the listeners waiting for your posts. Oh no, the, <laughs> the pressure! The pressure! I'm back off. Um, that's awesome. Uh, let's see. Um, I guess uh, update for me. I'm about to leave for Italy, so I guess when you are listening to this now, I'll be frolicking around Milan Design Week. Yeah, I will report back when I get back. What's it? What's what's Italian for goodbye? Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> ciao, Bella. That's, I don't know. That's all I got is ciao. I don't even know what hello is. Yeah. Buongiorno? Uh, no, bon, buongiorno. That, is it? Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Yeah, I was just Italian. in Italy. I okay. should... I, I I could be teaching a... Italian a master class. class. Oh, wow. A master class on Italy. Yes, on Italy. Um, Not Italian. Yeah, so we'll... I, I don't know what we're... F- we're figuring it out. Maybe you'll, maybe we'll have Reed fill in for me this, this time. We'll got to yeah, talk to him. We, we, we have to talk to him first. We shouldn't just drop it on him on the pod. Hey, you're on the you're gonna be on the podcast. No, no decision. <laughs> you have to. Um, but yeah, I uh, are you excited? I'm this, really excited. This is your first time at Milan, right? Yeah, and and for those who may not be familiar with Milan Design Week, you know, m- mom, um, <laughs> Mil mom, uh, Milan Design Week is is like the largest design 
fest festival in the world from from what I consider or from what I know mm. or I consider it the biggest L thing largest furniture or just design yeah, in no, general no I would say definitely furniture based yeah. you know furniture houseware thing I mean you know that's what I like um, so that's exciting uh, and you know all the cool people are going Jasper Morrison the Brulek brothers yeah you guys are all meeting up uh, no no I hope so I hope I get to meet him one day. Have you ever tried reaching out to any of those guys on no. Instagram? No, but we have thought about reaching out to Karim. Yeah. Speaking of Karim. Oh, man. There's my segue. I never do good segues, James. <laughs> wait, wait. I'm just kidding. This, but, should we talk about this first? We're too early. It's okay. too early. So close. It would have been great. We will talk about Karim in a second. But we, was, we wanted to do a little follow-up pup on what? Episode 46, I think? Yes. Um, we talked about design resumes and how when my thought was i hate seeing a design resume with hate <laughs> okay hate, hate my the strongest <laughs> word in the book hate might be a strong he word. jumps to it uh i dislike seeing people put like i was a server at a restaurant on their design resume i i want to see design uh experience not server or gamestop experience mm. but but I, th you know, you had a good counterpoint to that. Yes. And uh, we had some people in the Discord also add in their two cents. And I got to say, I think everyone's right. I think I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I feel like the people in the Discord, especially, uh, oh, Matt Marchard giving us a happy birthday. Thank you very much for our for our one year anniversary. Um, but uh, our Barry. Yeah. Um, scroll up some more. Oh, we got to scroll up some more. Okay. Uh, I think he even summed it up better than I did. Yeah, let's hear it. So um, he says, hey, just listen to episode 46. I have a pretty strong opinion regarding non-design professional experience on resumes. There are a lot of students like James that may not have had an industrial design internship at that point of their lives. Part of any job, including design jobs, is showing up on time, seeing the same people every day without getting sick of them, being polite, <laughs> contributing to meetings, etc. Working at GameStop without getting fired for an extended period of time is evidence that a student can do these things and definitely strengthens their case as an applicant. Of course, it's better to prove these skills as a designer, but James is right that these students don't have much else. I'm right. Yes, you're right, James. <laughs> but uh, I thought I thought what R. Barry said was a much nicer, condensed version of what I was trying to say because I was so caught off guard <laughs> by your opinion. I was just like, oh, what? Um, yes, very, very good uh, in summation, R. Barry. I will say, once you do get your design experience down and you have, you know, a few jobs that you can put on yeah. your resume you can go ahead and put that yeah i mean off. those cincinnati kids they don't have to worry about filling in right right filling in those spaces but yeah if you got nothing uh, maybe you yeah you guys are right mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay nick i'm gonna be wrong someday <laughs> <laughs> all right all right back to my back to my career machine transition oh yeah so good dang man that's wow what a great transition i'm trying james um design news this week there was a article posted on D D Zine, mm -hmm. and it talked about how kareem rashid was mentioning that his unpaid internships are better than going to school for design mm. um i think kareem rashid was commenting on another article or something it was kind of a me meta article but you know, essentially, Krim's argument was, hey, you know, students go to design schools and they spend fifty to $100,000 a year, you know, learning design. And it's more valuable if they come work for me for free. And honestly, the knowledge they gain in three months is more than they would in a whole year of design school. Yeah. Um, so we just wanted to talk about this because it's it's definitely like a you know uh, it's it's strongly opinionated topic for sure for sure and i feel like i could argue kind of both sides of this coin yes it's interesting 
for sure. I, and that's why I want to get into it. Like what, what, I mean, what is your first thought? My, my first thought was I do agree. Like, you know, I, I've often, I, I know about this practice at uh, Karim Rashid Studios. I considered the internship myself at one point. I saw the post on his website way back when and saw the unpaid intern part. Right. To me, at that time, not having any internships and thinking, wow, like, wouldn't it be amazing to intern with Karim Rashid, even if I was unpaid? I, I was sort of in the position of it's better than nothing. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I also very much agree with him that there's there is um an exploit uh exploitation element to education in general right now, where I think that education is far overpriced for yeah. what it is, especially in America. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that that was something that I was thinking about was you know. There are some countries that offer, you know, free college education. And I was looking into it and, and, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But it seemed like uh, with the free education, they weren't necessarily providing housing or food uh, to their students. It was just free education. Right. Because I was trying to think about, like, if I didn't go to school, but I considered this an education to go work for Karen or Masheed, you know, would that be the same? Would that be similar to going to free college, but having to pay for a room and board essentially? Right. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of can see both sides of this argument. Well, what? So the the other side of the argument. Yeah, the other side of this argument is Karen Rashid works with prestigious brands. He's probably not strapped for cash. Um, you know, that's the impression that people get. Right. And so the fact that you are bringing in people to do work for you, you know, and not providing them anything in return except for experience and and that name on their resume. Right. I mean, it's, I don't know, that is, that is a sort of an ethical gray area. Yeah. I And then there's this other note that I want to touch on because I think it's an important note. Mm. Um, I feel like, unpaid internships benefit those who can afford to go and do an unpaid internship. Right. Right. So, you know, for, you know, someone who like has a family that can support them. I mean, you know, you're in school, you're in debt, probably, you know, Mm -hmm. you have a family that can pay for your rent while you live in New York for three months. I mean, not, not every student has that, that support. But couldn't you, couldn't you also just the same as you're racking up? Because that same person is probably racking up student debt, student yes. loan debt. Yes. Couldn't you also, it, instead of that, just be racking up credit card debt? Ooh, I don't. I mean, that's, and and this is kind of this. <laughs> I, I I feel like yes, yes, I would not suggest that. But I think there is some sort of weird transition here because. When I think about Kareem Rashid's statement of like, hey, you can study with me for, or you can intern with me for three months and you'll learn more than you will in a whole year. I mean, that's completely valid. I feel like every internship I had was like that. I mm-hmm. was like, way, you know, it just boosted your your skills way more than it did in school. Um, and it kind of makes me think like, I wonder if you could take out loans to go intern because you're right, like, yeah, the, these people who, you know, may not be able to afford an unpaid internship and, and go study in New York or, or go intern in New York, mm-hmm. they're already taking out loans for sure. Yeah. But, you know, why can't you just take out loans just to do internships? Yeah. I mean, I don't think banks allow that, right? Yeah, I, I have no idea. I have not, uh, I, I don't know much about loans in general. Right. Um. I was, I, I will say I was fortunate enough not to have to pay any or, or take out any student loans. Um, I do, I do wonder about, could you justify doing a four month internship if you took time off of school and also spent a full summer working to save up 
for those living expenses. I mean, I I do I do think that there is sort of like this uh this great quality or this great um like you make great gains by working for somebody like Karim Rashid. Right. You you do build up connections that you wouldn't otherwise. Right. Um and yeah, I think you would probably learn a tremendous amount. You would be working with other designers within his studio that are that are, you know, probably very impressive designers. I would be curious to know, you know, how many of these designers, how many of these unpaid interns, what they go on to do, what they if they end up being hired by Karam yeah. after their internships, if they go on to you know, other studios, if that cachet does pay off for them, you know, I would, I want to hear, I want to hear from that person who went through the unpaid internship. Yeah. You want to hear the results of the, and the entire process for yeah. sure. You know, it's, it's interesting. You talk about like saving up to go do an unpaid internship and, you know, like working in a coffee shop, or whatever. I, mm-hmm. this is another thing that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk, yeah. The uh, entrepreneur social media guru. Yes. Um, Gary talks about this quite a bit. I'm, I'm a, a follower of Gary's and he, uh, he talks about like, you know, instead of going to school, just go work for someone for free for two years. Mm. I, I, I've personally been against unpaid internships. Um, you know, I am getting to the point where I would like to take on an intern at some, some stage of my, my career, but right. it, you know, I, I, there are per, certainly people out there that would come work for me for free right now, but yeah. I, I feel like morally I can't quite wrap my head around that because, because I feel like I was in the same situation when I was a student. Yeah. You know, I, I remember I, I did have some student loans. I was fortunate enough to have my parents pay for half of my school. So that was awesome. Um, but obviously I worked really hard to pay off the other half and, you know, I worked during school um, and then, you know, during the summers, I try to get some odd jobs here and there because I did have two unpaid internships. Yeah. I think another thing to note is, you know, if you want it badly enough, you should figure out a way to maybe, you know, take on that part-time job, you know, as a server after, after you get back from your internship right. during the day. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing that I kept thinking about with this was four months of your life goes by like that you know it goes by really quickly and but this these are four months that i don't know like if i met somebody and they're like yeah i did an unpaid internship with karen rashid for four months like i don't know that i would be like oh whoa why'd you do that i i think i i don't know i guess i guess i can see the benefit of doing something like that um but I, but I also feel like if I were in the place of Karim Rashid, I would have a hard time justifying not paying my interns because because they are providing a service. Yeah, it does seem a little bit more. It it seems less logical for Karim to not pay his interns than me, yeah. right? Um, yeah. I mean, I don't have unpaid interns, but like theoretically, someone who's starting out. Yeah, doesn't actually have as much capital as Krim does. Right, but it seems like Karim has had this practice for a while, yeah. And it seems like he doesn't, he doesn't have any sort of incentive to stop it because I've, I've not really heard too much because I feel like I would hear at this point through the grapevine, living in New York, you know, being amongst a lot of designers, I feel like I would hear through the grapevine about people you know, being exploited by Karam and getting nothing out of it and like it being a, a bad practice, especially now in the age of social media. Yeah. I I have to think that if it if it were such a bad deal and people were really upset by it, there would be a lot of I don't know, stink in the air essentially. I, I have a friend who interned for Krim. Really? Mm-hmm. So um, unpaid? Yeah, unpaid. And? And uh he seem to enjoy it i mean uh, he uh you know we we were kind of friends in school more like acquaintances yeah. um and you know i i didn't really keep in touch with him that much and then i got to new york i think design week two week two years ago 
and he like met up with him and he was like, yeah, I'm working for Kareem Rashid. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, you're working for Kareem. Like that's, yeah. that's crazy. Right. Like I Was did... that crazy with a K? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I could, I could hear that. Um, and cause, cause I had not thought of him as like going on to work for like a big name designer like that. I, you know, I, I didn't even realize that, that, that he was headed that way. Yeah. And, um, so I was like really proud of him. Like, congrats. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, he seemed to got, get a lot out of it and it seemed to, from, from what I've talked to him and seen from his career so far, it, it seemed to have helped. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. You know, the thing that, that Karen references in the article is, um, this idea that there were, it was a common practice in a lot of Italian design studios. Yeah. I feel in like Milan. Yeah. Like if we, if we roll the years back. Yeah. And you start thinking about apprenticeships. Right. And those kind of things. Yeah. So so he says, I was an unpaid intern in uh, Milanese design office, uh, Rodolfo Bonetto Studio, for one full year after I graduated with my master's. Uh, he, he tried to apply to Ettore Sotsas, and he couldn't afford him. Like he, And Sotsas had uh, seven unpaid interns in an office of 14, but still struggling to survive. You know, I, it sounds like he's, he's saying that this is sort of a tradition. And, and I do think that it probably comes out of the apprenticeship. Yeah. Um, sort of mindset. And another way to think about it as well is if, if Karim did have to take on paid interns, like say like whatever the laws changed, you have to pay interns now. It's likely that, there'd be less internships. Yeah. There'd be less people gaining wor- real world experience because, you know, Krim can't take on five interns anymore. He can only take on, he can only afford to take on two. Yeah. Right. Um, it, it, I think another point to make here as well is paying interns. They're, they're, they're interns, right? Right. Like their skills might not be up to par. Yeah. And certainly, I think designers should be paid for their work. Um, it, but you know, should designers be paid? Should interns be paid for work that doesn't actually move the studio forward? Per se. Mm. I mean, for example, let's say you're interning for Karim. You kind of know SolidWorks. You kind of know KeyShot. You can hack some stuff together. You're only a sophomore. Yeah. Um, and you know, you provide renderings. And yeah, you've learned a ton because guess what? You got super good at key shot because, you know, you, you didn't know how to do it. And now you've made something, but Karim, that's not the level of quality that he presents to his clients. Mm-hmm. You know, he has to go to his junior designer and be like, Hey, you know, the intern tried to do this. He <laughs> they, they couldn't quite do it. So can yeah. you redo it? And, and yeah, I mean, to pay for someone to learn, you know, I could see where that that like disconnect is yeah yeah i mean it's an investment it to to pay an intern is an investment and i think it's a worthwhile investment um but yeah i rem- i i remember uh i think this is in scrubs and in scrubs they were quoting a famous doctor they they said but they they said find me an intern that only doubles my work and i'll kiss his feet something <laughs> like that you know you know, interns interns are an investment. I I I have to say, I, I think to, to sum it all up, I I I don't know. I I have a hard time having a strong stance on this, but what I can have a hard strong stance on is I feel that if I were in Karam's position, I would pay my interns. Yes. I agree with that. I actually did come in to this conversation with a stronger stance, uh of being like, hey, I don't. Th- I think unpaid internships are wrong. But after discussing it in length, like I, I have never really thought about it or talked about it in depth. But I, I think I have a less strong stance now, yeah. which is interesting. But I, I would be interested to hear what the people in the Discord have to think. So let us know what you think about. You know, is an unpaid internship ever okay? Oh wait, I have one more idea. Oh, <laughs> okay. I was thinking about the student loan thing. I uh-huh. think. I wonder if you could do like part-time school where you like pay for like, no, what if you take out student loans for community college? 
uh-huh. or a really cheap school. Yeah. And then take one class every semester and, or like fail it or something and just like burn that cash. Yeah. Just so that you can use the rest of the, the <laughs> money to go intern. And Okay. That's a crazy idea. Anyways. If, if anybody, uh, yeah, wants to get in on Nick's Ponzi scheme... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> his email is um yeah just sign up oh man <laughs> all right well uh, yeah that was a long little design news segment but uh yeah let us know what you guys think on the discord yeah um this week we were trying to think of a topic and we couldn't think of one <laughs> we, we had we had podcast block and we were like hey podcast block is similar to d- designs block yeah so we, and, and we busted out the post-it notes and we just went to town. We brainstormed all over this place. Um, yeah, we wanted to talk about designer's block. Yeah. I mean, this is something that I think commonly people people come into designer's block knowing writer's block and... Artist's and, block. Yeah, artist block. But designer's block, that's, you know, it's a thing. It's a thing we all struggle with from mm-hmm. time to time. And... Uh, Nick, I have worked with you now for for a year, I guess, or maybe maybe a bit shorter, but about a year. And I've seen I've seen your workflow and you seem to be constantly on it. But I want to know if you ever encountered designer's block and how you deal with it. Yes, and I think this is this is that's a funny observation because uh, so, so when I get designer's block, when I can't think of any ideas, I keep sketching. <laughs> so it still looks like I'm working. Right. Oh, it's a good technique. You fooled me. Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, but I mean, I mean, this is, there are many different ways to like get over designer's block. W- one of the ways I do is, you know, I sit down and if I can't come up with an idea, I just put my pen to paper. And right. And it doesn't matter what I sketch. Like, you know, say I'm trying to think of a toaster. Yeah. And I can't think of any toaster ideas. Well, I'll just start doing like a box or something. I, yeah. You know, just moving my hand. Right. Because I feel like no matter what, you know, maybe there's some sort of weird scribble or like if I start scribbling and just drawing weird lines. Yeah. Maybe there's some sort of intersection of scribble that will inspire my mind to be like, oh, wait. Maybe that could be part of the the toaster, right? Yeah, I mean the the thing is is that doesn't every design project start off with designer's block? Isn't that kind of where you will always start? Yeah, that's true. Because it's like you get the design brief and you're like, uh, n- okay, let me. So do I? Uh, mm. And then you're just sitting there, <laughs> like, yeah. so scared to start. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's one thing that you do try to get from design school is a process to push you through any sort of block or at least enough experience to where you've 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 figured out where you can jump to if you experience a block yeah i and that and this is the thing it's like a lot of times you know that that random sketching is it seems kind of wasteful, right? It's mm. like, oh, you're just kind of wasting your time in paper and ink. But I, th- I feel like the value, and this goes for any type of thing, is to just move forward. Mm. Because the th- thing that's going to happen is that you're going to sketch up a concept or you're going to build a concept or do something mm-hmm. that is horrible. <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna fail it's gonna break yeah i'm currently in the middle of working on my weight weight oh yeah i haven't really chatted about that on the podcast yeah what's that all about uh this was just a fun... how long are we gonna have to wait for it <laughs> this is a fun little <laughs> a long while <laughs> uh this is a kind of a side project i'm doing for the american design club exhibition coming up for new york design week nice um it is a paperweight slash kitchen timer oh it's made out of concrete and i'm actually building it um, and you know, the concept itself is just kind of like crazy and a little weird, a little bit more of an artistic conceptual object. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I could, I could have sat down with that brief of, Hey, come up with a, the, the exhibitions all about sound, mm-hmm. come up with a product that makes a sound. Mm. And I could have taken like weeks to sketch on it. Yeah. Um, but I was sketching during late night, Nick. 
and I just happened to sketch this. I think someone actually meant, commented, like, do, I, I forget, we were just sketching, right? I was yeah. just putting pen to paper, reading comments, and all of a sudden I come up with this idea of a paperweight and a timer, mm. and like, oh, that's a interesting idea. It, yeah. it may not be the best idea, yeah. but I just took it, and I'm just moving forward with it. There you go. And we'll see what happens. Yeah. Now, that's the thing is, and I think we have this unrealistic expectation that we feel like the first idea that goes down on paper sometimes, we feel like it has to be fully fleshed out and, mm, yeah, and yeah. wonderful. And that I've been through plenty of processes and I've seen, um, you know, product development from afar at different companies and seeing where concepts have come from have you know from from week one to week two to week three especially you know working at a place like peloton where they're developing big pieces of fitness equipment things are being developed for long periods of time and it's crazy to see what the first rendering was right versus you know the final a couple thing. months later, yeah. it's like, oh my god, why did we ever even think that that was a possibility? Right, you know, and uh, and so that's really interesting to see. Is that, uh, you know, it's it's I guess it's the whole thing of where people get to like the Instagram lies of like all oh, these pretty finished things being posted, and it's like, yeah, there there is a lot of messy, gross concepts that that get pushed aside and develop into something better. But unless you put that on paper, here's, this is one thing that's really interesting is you can, uh, like, you, I think everybody, uh, maybe, maybe not everybody, but I remember this vividly from, from doing writing in high school and in college. And it's like, if you write something down on the screen, it's far more difficult to edit it until you print it out on paper. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh -huh. until you print it out on paper and you can see those words and you can really, I don't know, maybe there's something to the tactility of it. I think it. you're right. Because that's why, I feel like that's kind of why I sketch too. Yeah. Why I just keep sketching because I feel like there's some sort of tactile like movement thing happening. Right. But then there's, but then, yeah, I mean, is that the, is that the, uh, the direct correlation to design or is it more something like 3D printing or model making? Because that's the one thing is I can get stuck in the sketch zone mm -hmm. and, and just be sketching and sketching and sketching and nothing ever moves into 3D. But once you do move into 3D, then it's like, oh my gosh, scale. Like all of a sudden, scale becomes a reality, right? And then there's more ideas that you can think of. Yeah, I, yeah. I that's a good note because that's another way that you might be able to get out of designer's block is switching up your medium that you're using. Uh, this has been an incredible thing for me doing VR. Yeah, um, there are some ideas that come really easily in virtual reality yeah there's some ideas which which come really easily in pen and paper sketches yeah um and it's kind of weird that they're different right. like you would think your brain doesn't change but you know the the tools do sometimes inspire ideas yeah yeah it's true i i think uh much more recently i've adopted sort of the crude cardboard modeling mm. um you know, like like a visibility studio has really pr proliferated, right? Um, and, and I think it's great. I think I think that kind of model making early on, where it's really tactile, and you're and you're actually sort of forming things to the way that you want them to be, uh, as opposed to three D printing, which is you know from from CAD direct from CAD, right? Um, but I also I love iterating through three D printing, especially if the object that I'm iterating on is, is small enough that, you know, you can take it off and really get a feel for, for the size and scale of something. I mean, obviously there are bigger products you can't necessarily do the same for, but right. I've seen people, I've seen people do things like, you know, scale down models and print them out just to get a sense of, or even just like details mm. of, 
of a, of something to get a sense of that composition. Yeah. Um, but you, oh, we're gonna... I had one more thought yeah. uh, about designer's block because I do find that I'm not able to resolve things in my mind as well as I can resolve things through conversation or through oh, talking about ideas. That's cool. And, uh, and so, cause like it happens so often that I'll have something in my mind. I'll think that I've had it figured out or I have a question in my mind. And as soon as I say it, as soon as I start talking about it, the answer kind of becomes so clear. Hmm. Um, I don't know if it's because you're sort of reading the reaction of somebody as you're expressing your idea or if it's just hearing it yourself. Yeah. Um, but there, I think there are a lot of, you know, People are different in this way. I think some people can sort of sort through all of that in their own heads, but I I don't think that I have that capability. I think I do need to talk about my ideas sometimes in order to resolve them. I think that's a good tactic as well. I know another tactic I use a lot is just taking a break. I mean, that's a classic tactic of just getting outside, doing something else. Um, You know, the thought behind it is like you have you are so close to this problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah. And just stepping away for a second and taking your mind off of that kind of passes that problem off to your subconscious. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of the subconscious design mm-hmm. idea. Uh, Nata Fukusawa is one of my favorite designers. He talks about this subconscious, uh, you know, design and interaction. Um, but, you know, letting your subconscious chew on an idea and then coming back, you know, a day later can really help solve that design block. Right. Now, I have a question for you, Nick. Yes. Because you are so engaged in side projects, uh, you know, as well as your client work, do you ever find that working on multiple projects, being able to jump to another one, does that ever help you with designer's block? I would say... Yes, I I do agree that kind of jumping around can help refresh your, not only your motivation, but also your mind. Um, Like I've been working on a lamp um, still under wraps, but it, you know, it, we've worked on some manufacturing things. And uh, just today I came up with this new idea for manufacturing it like super slim. Mm. And I don't know if it'll actually work or not, but we're going to, we're still working on it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like it's been an pro- ongoing project and I've been working on other things and just jumping back to it today. It just like it was like a bolt of lightning. Right. Yeah. I I will say that um, the MakerBot project that we did, the competition that we did, I for a while was was sort of struggling to figure out what to do yeah that well that was a very difficult project <sighs> well yeah because but, it was <laughs> open-ended it was make something the that, broadest <laughs> prompt in the world <laughs> make something that improves your life yeah uh yeah it's something to improve everyday living and so um what i ended up what i ended up doing and i don't think that this was a a conscious part of the project but i was i was home alone and i decided to reorganize uh one of my basically like my my clutter drawer right my your my catch-all you're procrastinating by cleaning that that's a oh common yeah thing. yeah yeah but during the cleaning i discovered these pens that fred and friends used to make that had this hole in it so you could spin it on your finger and i was trying to figure out the other thing that i was trying to figure out for the MakerBot project was how to utilize uh an allen key an allen wrench because because you get so many of them from buying ikea furniture i was i had all the all these wrenches i was like i i need to figure out a way to use these and suddenly like seeing that pen it all just like came together yeah that and so i i don't know that wasn't necessarily uh yeah i think it it kind of was a procrastination thing but ended up being a part of the process if you guys have designers block start procrastinating yeah well no i mean i think i think cleaning in general if you're trying to make sense of your mind and the space around you is completely messy then maybe it is a good maybe it is a good thing to clean it up there yeah there's i there there's i can see so the value in that for sure yeah um 
I also wanted to touch on a little bit of of some things I learned in school. Yeah. Which I don't necessarily use all the time, but I took this class in school called Creative Thinking Strategies, mm. which is kind of an intriguing class um, because it taught you, like the whole class was teaching people how to be creative. Mm. You know, you kind of think about creativity as something you're born with or like some people are creative, some people aren't. Um, but it was so interesting that there's a class that's like, hey, anyone can be creative. Mm. You know, and I, I don't know how much I agree with that or, or what that means, but um, there's a lot of strategies that we learned in that class and I might have touched on it in previous episodes, but uh-huh. um, there's some, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things. Um, a few things that I thought were really helpful were making lists. Mm. So you take, you know, whatever your project is, say you're making a picnic basket. Yeah. Right? And you just start making a list of everything that's related to a picnic basket. Yeah. Whether that's picnic, sandwiches, the park, grass, trees, the sky. You know, you just make a list. You just yeah. write word, just mind dump. Right. And then you pick another word that is completely unrelated. Let's say it's like library. And you just start making a list of words that are related to like books, you know, library card, you know, reading. And then what you do is you start matching those two lists together Hmm. a reading picnic or like what about a like library card bologna sandwich right is this where your whole familiarism thing came from no no the familiarism thing came from not to fukusawa but 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 it is it is kind of this like list matchmaking yes yeah familiarism again go back to listen to what was episode 42 or something we uh i don't know those kids at purdue could tell us (laughs) Uh, yeah, familiarism was a little more specific of matching uh, functions to things that aren't necessarily having those functions. Mm-hmm. But in general, matching and mixing things together, come you know you can come up with some creative ideas by mixing two weird things together. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. The list thing was really interesting. Yeah. You can also do like a mind map. I don't know if you've seen like people draw the bubbles and then they draw like you know picnic. And then they put a basket over here. And then, hey, things that are related to baskets. Yeah. Like Easter. Things that are related to Easter. That could be Christmas. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. I think I think any time that you can sort of jump, if you are experiencing designer's block and you can jump to an activity that, that might spawn something, even just like writing about the project that you're working on. Right. Just write. I, I've done that with many professional projects where I start to write down just describing the thing that I'm designing and and what where it's going and sort of start to like write a story about it so that I can make sense of it that way um and of course and I didn't I didn't want to necessarily touch on this for too long during this topic because I feel like I have touched on it touched on it so many times otherwise which is you know especially if you're having designer's block when it comes to form um you know Reed and I did the project around the form families. Mm, So if you go to Reed's Instagram or my Instagram, you'll find some techniques there of just how to build forms. If you're trying to do something, you're trying to break out of your comfort zone or you're trying to uh, develop forms that you wouldn't necessarily develop in sort of your traditional sketching method. Um, And then also uh, my continuous line drawing technique is also something that can unlock uh, different types of forms than you might otherwise come up with. Yeah, no, those are definitely good tips. Check those out for sure. So yeah, um, yeah, I, that was a good. Topic. I think we broke through the block. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, we want to get to some questions. Of course, every week we uh, answer questions from our email, but we had no voicemails this week, which is oh really sad. come on, guys, you guys have voices. <laughs> you guys know what mail is. Um, yeah. So if you want to send a Google voicemail in, our, the number is one six four six. 494-4011. And six, 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 I mean, the odds of you getting four, played 40, pretty high. Yeah. Um, but we did get some questions in in the minor details podcast at gmail.com. And our first question comes from Josh. And Josh says, what's your opinion on the importance of sketching in industrial design? I mean, that's a very broad question. But, yes. I think, but I think it comes from an interesting place because he goes on to say, this question seems to have mixed answers at least where i'm studying especially with my peers many think sketching is a skill of the past 
and there are other techniques that can be used to communicate a design. Mm. So this is coming from Josh, who appears to be studying in school, and, you know, maybe there is this shift happening of students not necessarily thinking sketches are important anymore, mm. which is which kind of gives the question a little bit more, uh, I don't know, context and, and yeah. thought. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? My thought is, is that until we all have AR, VR g- glasses on all the time and we can just uh, s- gravity sketch in midair, <laughs> I think sketching is still very important. Unfortunately, for somebody who's trying to shirk off getting better at sketching, I think sketching is still kind of a magic trick. It's kind of a party trick. It's It's something that will amaze someone if you can sketch out your idea really rapidly um and i know you have your you're saying the person with the pen has the power has the power that's right um yeah i this is a interesting thought because i there is some validity to saying that the actual physical sketch isn't the important part of the design right like Mm -hmm. the important part of the design is the actual design that gets produced and used by you know a million people or whatever the product is. Um, But you are right. Like sketching is how we come up with ideas. Um, Sketching is a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Ideation sketching is very important to design and that's where you come up with ideas. Yeah. But you know, we're moving to VR. I don't know what that will entail. Do you think that as a medium, do you think that VR sketching will ever be as fast as paper sketching? I don't think oh are you referring to the fact that like speed you you can paper sketch anywhere you want you can paper sketch out anywhere you want but I'm also just concerned with speed like how quickly can you pump out VR sketches versus regular sketches it's not I that that, I don't think that quite like it doesn't really resonate because VR sketching is a little bit of a different it doesn't quite It's like apples and oranges Mm -hmm. in my head Mm -hmm. because I could sketch something up just as fast as I was sketching something up on paper in VR. Mm -hmm. The the thing with VR is it's a little bit of a mix between 3D modeling and sketching. Mm -hmm. So if you want your sketch in VR to be more fleshed out, yeah, you can take more time and put surfaces and things on it. Um, I yeah, I'm not because just like just like pen and paper, you could sketch something out on paper and then add marker to make it more... I mean, the, the only thing that I'm trying to get at, especially with iteration, is what what would be faster? Because this person... V, I, VR is faster for iteration. Uh, it is? For for small details of iteration, like like what I was talking about my weight weight uh-huh. recently, I kind of came up with the idea on paper. Right. And then, you know, I had this idea of making this big concrete uh, block with the timer knob on top of the block. Um, and that was my idea. I came to the idea intuitively kind of ad lib physically on paper, kind of like just coming through that designer's block, like we just talked about. But then I jumped into VR for the iteration phase. Yes. Wait. So I I guess I didn't distinguish between ideation and iteration. Mm. So, so in the initial stages of sketching out, uh, a diverse set of ideas, I, I feel like paper is still a little bit better for that. Okay. In some instances. it Kind of like what we're talking about. It's like VR has different tools, and the tools sometimes inform the design. Yeah. Um, but pen and paper is more, you're, you're thinking more conceptually, mm-hmm. where I think VR, you're thinking more in, in form. Right. But, we- but from iteration standpoint, like I, I took that weight, weight idea into VR and, and literally pumped out 50 concepts in an hour. Yeah. You can't do that with pen and paper. The other the other thing that I think will always advantage sketching at, at least in the near future is this back and forth between designers when they're talking about details and when, you know, say you're in the CAD phase and you're trying to communicate, "Oh, you should add this detail or yeah. or add something like this" because there's only so much that you can communicate verbally before you really have to sketch out what you're talking about. Right. Um, and so I think that that's, that's another moment 
that maybe is not discussed when you're a student because you're you might not be interacting in that way mm -hmm. but in the professional world there's so many times where you're sitting down with somebody and you're sketching just details of something that somebody's working on in CAD um, to push that forward yeah I do want to touch on another part of this question which mm -hmm. might might be some some validity to Josh's Josh's thought and his peers' thought um, I think sketching to present or presenting your sketches to a client or to mm. your boss mm. or to a team is something that might be considered a little bit more old school. Yeah. Um, you know, depending on the situation, depending on the context, a lot of times there are studios and, and designers out there who, instead of presenting sketches, will present key shot renderings or, right. or 3D models. Right. Um, just because it can more... Uh, accurately communicate the concept yeah yeah i think that that is that is a problem sometimes is that if you sketch out something for for a client to review they might get hung up on something that that you don't want them to get hung up on it, here, here's here's an example here's an example um i've i've had a few projects where i work on like accessories for for the the home or or your phone and and a lot of times like phone accessories things like that are pretty simple like if you have a charger it's you know maybe you have an like an apple charger yeah for the iphone the the, the apple one kind of just looks like an aluminum block and yeah. it has a little thing sticking out of it right the lightning port and if you sketched that out and showed it to a client the client would laugh at you and be like what is this <laughs> you sketched a cube yeah um, and that's like the scenario where you, you can't really sketch in the fillets and, you know, put the lighting just right. So it looks realistic or, right. I mean, you could, and you could render it out really realistic, but it's more effective to do a quick 3d model and render it out in key shot right. to communicate that, Hey, yes, this is a block, but it is an, you know, it's a very you know, nicely finished block with a certain type of anodizing and it you know it has this little detail on the back like yeah. those things don't always communicate through pen and paper sketches right yeah i would love to see that internal apple idea review <laughs> just like that <laughs> it's just johnny they're sitting there be like yeah. all right i need uh the a square it's aluminium <laughs> um but yeah uh that is that is a great question josh yeah thanks for sending in josh i we have one, one, one more no, quick question. No, we don't have any more time. One more quick question, James. Just, oh, quick question. Just quick one. It's got to be so quick. <laughs> it's got to be so quick. Um, this one comes from <laughs> this one comes from Moser Makes, and they say, Hey, Nick and James, love the podcast. I had a question about design sketching. I don't come from an industrial design background. I'm an electrical engineer, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool to yeah. think we have electrical engineers listening. It's electric. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Keep going. I've noticed in many of your design sketches I see on Instagram that people add a rectangle to the background behind a section of the sketch. Nick, I see that you do this in many of your sketches as well. So I'm wondering, what is the purpose to the rectangle? Well, Nick, I think you <laughs> are positioned to answer this question. Um, this is actually a common thing that we talk about on my live stream Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. um, but I like adding the background box, the background rectangle. Uh, I think we called it a vignette in school, which when you look up vignette, that's like, it doesn't quite make sense. But um, the background box helps compose all the parts of the sketch on the paper. Mm -hmm. It kind of fills up the page and creates a, just a nicer composition. It's purely aesthetic. Just seems like it makes the sketch a little bit, a little bit more balanced. Mm -hmm. You can use it to tie different parts of the sketch together. So, on my chair sketches, I have the main chair, and then I tie it together with the side view. Yeah. Um, and then another key aspect of the background box is that you want to make sure the background box is kind of like a window. Mm. You never want the background box to become below an object because kind of feels like the object's going to fall into the to the box. Mm. So it's always above the baseline, the ground plane. Okay. And then it also should never intersect with any like it you don't want the box to intersect with another intersecting line on your sketch. So if you have a 
if you're sketching a chair and it has some sort of complex, you know, curvature on the front leg, mm-hmm. you don't want to have that box go right into that front leg because it's going to cause a lot of tension. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think it just helps compose the sketch a little bit better. It makes it look nice. Hmm. It's purely a style thing. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't use boxes, but after that explanation, I, I might now give it a shot. But, but I, I have noticed that a lot of, uh, SCAD grads use the rectangle. Yeah. We, well, we were taught that way. Yes. Um, and it's stuck. It's stuck. <laughs> Uh, but yes, thanks for sending it in, Moser Makes. And if you guys have a question yourself, minor details podcast at gmail dot com. Yes, I think we're kind of low. If you send a question, like a, <laughs> if you send a question like a while back that we never answered, you know, send it again. It get sometimes they just get buried and we we just forget about them. Yeah. Um, of course, every week we like to give a shout out of the week, and this week we wanted to shout out Mauricio Romano. I can't believe that we've never shouted him out. And his Instagram handle is at Roman or Romano Mao. Um, Romano Mao, yeah. Uh, and Mauricio, I'm a big fan of Mauricio. Oh yeah, he's he's been a uh, in the Instagram game for a long time. Recently, has had a resurgence. I I'm digging his his frequent post recently. Yes. Um, he's a designer at Oculus, so I'm a big fan of that as well. Um. Always doing really beautifully done objects. Like I'm looking right now, uh, James has pulled up his corner chair. Oh yeah, and they're they're beautiful, and they're also always a little bit thought provoking. They always have like a little bit of like a oh that's interesting. Yes, yeah. I think the the wonderful thing about Maurizio is that he's always showing off. He's or not necessarily showing off, but showing the dirty part of the process. Like he's showing kind of everything. Oh, yeah. Putting it all out on the table. Mm -hmm. And I love his sketching style. And especially when he starts to mix like rough CAD and sketching. I think which he does a lot. And that's a a pretty unique thing to Mauricio. I don't see a lot of other. I mean, there's a few, but he'll take. 3d renders sometimes like key shot renders and then sketch over those renders to add like a little bit of extra style yeah it's it's pretty unique yeah um but but yeah I, great mix of of all kinds of different type of design and work absolutely no i i i'm a big appreciator and i hope i hope uh this recent resurgence from Maurizio continues because yeah. I love to see what he's up to. Yeah, and you know, hopefully there's some people that haven't heard of him before. He's a he's a cool guy to follow, so check him out. For sure. Um yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. Join us on the Discord. Join us. Let us know what you guys think about Designer's Block. How you, how do you get out of Designer's Block? Yeah, we are currently live on the Discord, by the way. Yeah, that if, is if, a perk. If you want to hear the podcast as we record it, and then hear a little design behind the scenes afterwards. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got to get on the Discord. <laughs> um, and of course, as always, subscribe, like, comment. YouTube. YouTube. Spotify. Spotify. Apple Podcasts. That's right. Google Play. Um, our beautiful intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. Yes. And as always... I'm at Nick P. Baker. And I'm at I Draw on Receipts. Peace out. Later.